The railways are Britain's largest customers. In a single year, the bill for stores and materials and fuel comes to no less than 130 million pounds. A third of this money goes on solid fuel, 14 million tons of it. Coal for locomotives, coke for the railway foundry, and fuel for the staff room stove. 20 million pounds are spent on steel, 600,000 tons. For locomotive building and maintenance, for constructing new standard carriages, replacing the old wooden wagons, and operating the complicated network upon which they run. 11 million pounds are spent on timber, for sleepers and crossings, for rolling stock, and a thousand and one other jobs needing wood. Seven million pounds are spent on textiles, for uniforms, for carriage upholstery, for wagon sheets, and many other things down to the humble sponge cloth. Outside these groups are items without number. 12 million gallons of petrol for road motor vehicles. Equipment for the cross-channel ferries. Shunting poles. And all the paraphernalia for cleaning and running stations, depots and offices. Oil to keep the wheels turning and the tail lamps burning. Paint to enhance and preserve. All these and over 800,000 other items are purchased and stored by the stores department. At any one time, the value of all the materials in stock is in the region of 75 million pounds. This then is supply, stocked at large and small depots wherever there is a demand throughout the country. If this demand were constant, the job of fitting supply to demand would be a lot easier. But requirements fluctuate, and therefore the demand is far from constant. In this area, where at this instant demand is great, an insufficient supply would keep men and machinery idle. And that means money wasted. Here, where demand at present is small, too much stock would mean capital lying idle. And again, money wasted. There must be just enough, enough to supply every railway depot in the right quantities, in the right place, at the right time. Just how is this even balance of supply with demand maintained? To find out, we must first take a look inside a store's warehouse. Here is one, the largest of several at a locomotive works. All commodities are kept in order so that they may be found quickly when wanted. To do this, every item is classified, given a section or bin to itself, and numbered. For example, these bearings have the new British Railway standard catalogue number. Before they were included in the standard catalogue, the number on the Western region would have been this. On the London Midland region, this. And on the Eastern and Northeastern region, this. On the Southern region, it would have been this. And on the Scottish region, it would have been this. And yet, they're still the same bearings. So it's far more convenient to give them one new number to identify them on all regions. A BR standard catalogue number defines an item. Its description, its size, its specification. It also simplifies purchasing and accounting arrangements and the transfer of materials from one region to another. 
These drawbar washers are made of rubber and steel and eventually will be fitted to the draw gear of a locomotive. But as they leave the warehouse, let's see at what point further supplies should be ordered. Not forgetting that it's uneconomic to stock too many and disastrous to stock too few. The answer lies in a minimum stock correctly assessed and kept separate from the rest. In this case, the minimum has almost been reached as the two remaining bins on the left contain the minimum quantity and are labelled as such. To the store's issuer, the minimum acts as a visual danger signal, a reminder that stocks are getting low. Practices vary slightly on the different regions, but at this particular depot, when the minimum is broached for the first time, a green metal tablet is removed from the bin and taken to the special issuer. The special issuer is responsible for seeing that all stocks under his control are reported to the storekeeper immediately they fall to the minimum level. He knows this has happened when he receives the tablet, but he must watch, and so must the foreman, to see that no material is issued without a signed demand note, and that the tablets are sent in when they should be. It's then up to him to start things moving to obtain a further supply. The metal tablet, the stock low tablet as it's called, is reversed and the date added. The reverse side is painted red. Red for danger. Red for stock low. Materials on order. A warning and a record that action has been taken. Meanwhile, the stock low card moves on its way. It joins the many other forms which find their way into this office for stock recording and for keeping a check on expenditure and costing. The card from the warehouse records the stock level of one particular item. To keep track of all the items in constant use at any large works, an equivalent number of cards must be kept on hand, which means a lot of documents. But they are all essential for keeping that balance between supply and demand. And when it comes to our drawbar washers, their progress has to be recorded too, correctly. A wrong catalogue number, a query, a wrong figure means extra work for someone. Back in the warehouse, the special issuer records the date the order was sent off to the contractor and also the quantity ordered. So that six weeks later, when the new consignment arrives, he has a handy reference. The stores ordered 400. The contractor will send an invoice for 400. Now it's the job of the storesman to count them and report how many are delivered so that in case of discrepancy only the quantity received is paid for. But before the new washers can be used there's something else to be done. If we are to maintain the standards of safety on the railways and the level of craftsmanship which is necessary for locomotives and rolling stock, all articles used in building and maintenance must conform to equally high standards. That is why samples of the new consignment of washers must undergo a series of tests before any of them are used. If they can stand up to the drastic treatment meted out to them at the Materials Inspection Laboratory, they will easily withstand the stresses and strains of normal service. So, into service they go. And with the tablet turned to its normal position, green for go, green for materials available, the cycle of supply, as it's sometimes called, is complete. So much for storekeeping for maintenance work.
There's a difference when it comes to a building program. Somewhere, a production line is on the move. A specified number of carriages must be finished on schedule and then put into service to earn revenue. The problem with the conveyor belt is that it must be constantly fed. But the materials for this don't appear just by magic. The exact quantity of each component must be calculated in advance, down to the last luggage rack. This is where the stores come into the picture. A picture that goes back perhaps two years to the time when these carriages were but a pipe dream in the mind of the carriage and wagon engineer. The day comes when this is no longer a dream, but a reality, in the form of a schedule on the storekeeper's desk. So many carriages of this kind to be built, so many of that, requiring thousands and thousands of different items, all of which must be available at the right moment. The first thing is to carry out a check to see what there is in stock for the forthcoming building program in addition to what's necessary to meet the needs of normal maintenance during the coming months. If the store's issuer has laid out his bins neatly, he should be able to see at a glance how much he has. A lot of time can be saved by unit piling. No need to count all these asbestos sheets, just the sections that protrude and multiply by 50. The results of the stock taking come back to the storekeeper's office and find their way into the schedule. Where necessary, Fresh supplies are ordered, either from railway works or from an outside contractor, until the stores are stacked with materials and commodities of all shapes and sizes, ready for the building program to begin. The new building program is well underway. Materials are flowing from the store's warehouses to the workshops. But on the luggage rack front, things aren't looking too healthy. Further supplies should have arrived from the contractor weeks ago, but there's still no sign of them. A hold-up must be avoided at all costs. So something must be done, and quickly. The storekeeper gets on the phone to his regional headquarters and asks the store superintendent to urge delivery from the contractor. In the meantime, he decides to give his colleagues in the other regions a ring. Derby can't help. Swindon has none to spare. But Eastleigh comes to the rescue with 50, though the job requires another 200. Still, they'll help out for the time being. Just in time, the new consignment arrives at the works and a crisis in the shops is averted thanks to the assistance of another region and the vigilance of the store's staff. On a production line, it's no good waiting till trouble develops. Possible shortages must be anticipated and attention equally divided between present problems and future needs. A building program is only one of the store's many preoccupations. In addition, they supply outstations, those lonely supply depots placed at vital points along the permanent way. At Reading, for example, the everyday needs of 24 signal and telecommunications inspectors on the western region are met once a month. Here they keep all manner of things, from a level crossing gate hinge to a watch screw one millimetre long. 
Not that such delicate things go into a bin. They are kept, along with hundreds of other watch components, in this small cabinet, ready for the watch and clock repairers in the same building. Most stores are responsible for old apparatus which is repairable. These broken telephone instruments, for example, are sent in, stored until the workshops can tackle the job, and come back ready for further service. Those beyond repair are scrapped, and the metal salvaged. Apart from buying, the stores department also sells. It sells vast quantities of scrap to the tune of nine million pounds a year, recovered from track, worn out rolling stock and other apparatus. Even the sweepings from the workshop floor are a source of revenue. But at some works, it isn't sold. It finds its way straight into a melting pot on the premises. This reclamation depot for non fellows scrap is located at the Derby Carriage and Wagon Works, and its output is supervised by the Stores Department. White metal borings are converted into valuable ingots, then palletized and stored until they can be used again. If it weren't for the sort of reclamation carried out in this smelting shop, and other economies like general repair work, the annual bill for materials on the railways would be very much bigger. Certain freight can travel in the open. Other goods have to be protected against the weather, with wagon sheets, for instance. The stores are responsible for making these. Four factories, each on a different region, are engaged on the manufacture of this particular kind of sheet while seven others do repair work and turn out canvas goods of other kinds. We hear a lot about standardization these days. But there's one thing we haven't yet been able to standardize, the measurements of our uniformed staff. Over a quarter of a million men and women have to be fitted every year, the long and the short not to mention the others. Most of the clothing is made by contractors, but some of it comes from this factory in Manchester, run, again, by the stores department. Now, having bought or having made all the commodities, where do they go? In the open compounds, the situation isn't desperate, yet. But when it comes to putting them under cover, we can't pretend that our accommodation is as good as it might be. For let's face it, most railway buildings are nearly a hundred years old, some of them even older. They just weren't built to cope with the conditions of today. In the early years of steam locomotion, they fulfilled their purpose more than adequately. But railway facilities have always been improving and expanding. And gone are the days when the works or the stores could extend their premises accordingly, outwards at any rate. Something has had to go, and in the past it was usually the stores, either upwards to the roof, and that can be quite a headache when things are in constant demand, or in some cases, down into the bowels of the earth. We have had to do our best with what we had, but vaults such as these, however well laid out, can only have a low standard of efficiency. Now, some of these things are being put right. Materials are on their way to better premises. Isolated examples, perhaps, but an encouraging sign for the future. Even if we're not fortunate enough to have warehouses that were built for the job, at least we can modernize our old ones. It may cost money to lay a new floor and install standard bins like these, but against the outlay can be set such things as happy working conditions and greater efficiency.
Accommodation is just one of the problems the stores are facing. There are others that are constantly receiving our attention. Officers from headquarters in every region get together regularly and deal with such problems jointly. In this way, the best ideas, the best methods used on the various regions can be adopted by all. Much has been done, but much is still to be done. In a job like this, there will always be scope for hard thinking, constructive thinking. The spending of 130 million pounds a year, the keeping of stocks of a value of more than 70 million pounds, the choice between doing our job well and doing it less well, all these can make a great difference to the financial results of British Railways at the end of a year. The stores must always remember too that their own efficiency is reflected in the efficiency of the whole railway undertaking. For there is not one department which does not depend, to a greater or less extent, on the service which it is the business of the stores department to give. for road motor vehicles, equipment for the cross-channel ferries, shunting poles, and all the paraphernalia for cleaning and running stations, depots, and offices. Oil to keep the wheels turning and the tail lamps burning. Paint to enhance and preserve. All these and over 800,000 other items are purchased and stored by the stores department. At any one time, the value of all the materials in stock is in the region of 75 million pounds. This then is supply, stocked at large and small depots wherever there is a demand throughout the country. If this demand were constant, the job of fitting supply to demand would be a lot easier. But requirements fluctuate. For sleepers and crossings, for rolling stock, and a thousand and one other jobs needing wood. Seven million pounds are spent on textiles. For uniforms, for carriage upholstery, for wagon sheets, and many other things down to the humble sponge cloth. Outside these groups are items without number. 12 million gallons of petrol. The railways are Britain's largest customers. In a single year, the bill for stores and materials and fuel comes to no less than 130 million pounds. A third of this money goes on solid fuel, 14 million tons of it. Coal for locomotives, coke for the railway foundry, and fuel for the staff room stove. 20 million pounds are spent on steel, 600,000 tons. For locomotive building and maintenance, for constructing new standard carriages, replacing the old wooden wagons, and operating the complicated network upon which they run. 11 million pounds are spent on timber, 